So yesterday in Wellington, a win for Ireland against the Merry All Blacks, 30 points to 24. That's a second win of this tour for Ireland, and we stay in Wellington for Saturday's finale. Test number three, we have the series on the line. We have an opportunity for Ireland to make uh, more history. We have an All Blacks coach under pressure for his job, so it's fair to say this is all coming to the boil very, very nicely. Brian O'Driscoll, great to have you on. Yeah, Joe, good to be back. Lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. Yeah, I've um, I've been away on my holidays and I've missed quite a, quite a lot of action. I did try and disconnect from it, so I'm I'm on catch up. But um, yeah, obviously it's it's very hard to stay disconnected from anything now with social media. Um, and so even though we were I was away on a different time zone, um, I, you know, waking up, particularly the second test, you know that it's been an Irish victory when you look and you've got 21 WhatsApps, you know, as first thing in the morning. So, um, yeah, very um, exciting times from an Irish perspective. Um, and all the more reinforced now with that Mary victory yesterday, like what, what does that do for the feel-good factor within the overall squad? Sometimes the dirt trackers, as they're known, the kind of second string feel disconnected from the test series, but that has been a really clever ploy of having those two Maori games in weeks one and three. Ordinarily, you'd look at weeks one and two and then and then focus on the test match for week three. But I think that's been really clever in keeping everyone very focused on and part of the squad. Um, and now all the more the fact that they've gotten the victory in that Maori game just gives that burst of energy going into, you know, your final three or four days of your season before you get to sit on a sun lounger for a few weeks. So it's it's just built up perfectly for where they'd want to be pitched at the right level, knowing that they've got one more huge 80-minute performance in them. That's an interesting point you make. Nothing worse, I'm sure, than half of a travelling party checking out with 10, 12 days of a tour left. Well, it happens so often on Lions tours in particular, you know, that you see... Um, you know, midweek games often, you know, throughout the test series in the first and second week, and then they keep it away from the third because, you know, tired bodies and I don't want it to distract from what might be, you know, a, um, a series in the balance. Whereas I think this has been really smart and it, and it does keep people connected. You know, it's a, a huge distraction for players gone off tour when they know their final game is, the Tuesday of the second week, knowing that there's still a week and a half to go before, you know, and all they're going to be doing is holding hit shields. Um, and, you know, it, it depends on your circumstance, depends on what's been gone on in the tour, whether you've had some success from it. And on paper, this, this tour looked precarious, always does anytime you go down to New Zealand, even with our recent success against them, you know, but what has transpired has been, uh, fantastic so far we talked beforehand as to what would be perceived as success you know you have to win minimum a game and ideally one in the in the Maori game one test match so I think already irrespective of what comes at the weekend this has been a very very successful tour there's no doubt but those players are certainly not thinking that with a few days to go they smell blood now they think there's a test series victory They've they didn't manage it in um, South Africa back in 2016, was it? Yeah. They, they they lost narrowly. They managed it in Australia. Now can they go to the most difficult, challenging place to go and tour and pick up a series against the mighty All Blacks? Well, they'll feel as though they definitely can. I remember we spoke on the eve of this tour, and from memory, your sense then was that as the reality of this tour was dawning, there was real trepidation. I mean, we were talking about a. Uh, a distinct possibility, at least. You can easily go out there and lose five games if things unravel. Oh, that could have happened. I, there's no doubt. Um, but it just shows the, the kind of mental capacity of where this team is, the strength and depth, the level of coaching, the um, hunger and appetite you know, to, for continual improvement that they have gone out. And even though they were beaten in the first test that... There was no, they weren't deflated by it that they um, that they came back and and reacted and you know certainly some things went their way particularly with you know the the number advantage in the second test but that that comes down to very good discipline versus very bad discipline that's not you know we can't look at the referee and feel very fortuitous with some of those decisions that was what it was and um, so they they completely outplayed the All Blacks in the second test if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know they had them scrambling they had the all blacks running out of ideas which you don't you don't see very often i think we did see it back in november and we are, we're always mindful in those november games even though we've managed to win a couple of them against the all blacks in the last three or four years that it is the end of their tour that they all have one eye on their holidays so to put ourselves in that position now and win a test match and, and outplay them in their own patch i think gives such um, a shot in the arm of confidence going into looking down, you know, what might be a, a possible quarter final match against them in France in 15 months time. So all these things are just building. Mm. I, I think you're all, I'm always mindful of not getting caught up in the euphoria of it all that, you know, we've been in similar territory in the past. It's building, but there's still pitfalls to be avoided and some that, I would still be extremely nervous about as we move forward and we'll we'll be going back over old territory here but um yeah i'm really interested to see what the selection will be this weekend um you know at the start of the tour you're not just anticipating best team possible it will be it will be but there's no way they would have thought that before the start of the tour there would have been a vision to have played certainly um you know, to have benched Johnny on one of the three occasions, to have started one of the other tens. That had to have been an initial policy, but that's all been thrown out. Mm. Um, you know, it's all been shelved. It's all been, um, you know, put to the side. The, the kind of thoughts of building for the World Cup are not in line of sight right now. It's very much about a series victory and here and now. I guess there's good and bad to that. Imagine going down and winning a series in New Zealand, you know, that would be talked about forever more. Um, but yet, no matter what, there's always going to be, you know, the nervousness around that game time for those players that don't have initials beginning with JS. Would you rather have on your CV a World Cup semi-finalist or won a series in New Zealand with our Oh, good question, Joe. Very good question. I don't think I don't think you could you could go. Oh, it'd be great to go and win, get get to a semi final and lose. I think I, I think a series victory in New Zealand is greater than a semi final of a World Cup. Being honest, it is because mm. it's something tangible. It's a it's yeah. I don't know whether I presume there's a shield or a cup of some sort. There is one for every series these days. So there is something at the end to hold on to to go. We beat this. We by the way, we beat New Zealand in their own backyard. Um, versus and we do great. We got to a semi-final, um, hmm. which I know that we've never gotten to. But um, I think I think what I what more of a balanced argument would be the prospect of getting to a final versus a series victory. Uh, you know, in a, into a World Cup final with um, with it still to play versus a, a series victory against the All Blacks. I think that's more on par. But a semi-final of a World Cup versus a series victory. I think the series victory in New Zealand, you, you think about um, the Lions talking about it in 71. Like how many teams have gone, when was the last time 94. they were beaten? 94, the last France? time they lost a series at home. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, so yeah, I think, yeah, maybe we've, maybe I'm a bit distracted by the World Cup that this is still enormous in its own right, but it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be another missed opportunity for guys getting game time and mm. those games are beginning to run out. Any uh, headline thoughts from the Mary win? Um, like, you know, again, I've, I've, I've skated through the game very quickly. Um, I think what's, what's really impressive is, um, is a young team um, having beaten, beaten and coming, coming back from 17 five down at halftime I think that's really impressive you know to not panic to not feel as though you've been overpowered that you're a young um you know relatively inexperienced team certainly lots of combinations playing together for the first time so for them to be able to find a way to get back into the game to create opportunities for themselves to have cool head at, at, at clear moments I think there's there's been a huge amount to take from that taking really good opportunities always looking to, to play heads up rugby you know the larmer try from the quick uh, line out from earls that's brilliant you yeah. know it's just it's just one step ahead and it's 
that shows a real appetite and a and an anticipation for what's what's next rather than sitting on your laurels and taking a break it's always you know next moment next moment how can we create something how can we put them under pressure and strain them and stress them mm. um i'm also impressed with um kieran treadwell i think he's been really physical um you know i i think i would have been one that would have had question marks around his selection, you know, within the environment, I guess I haven't been so impressed to think automatically, yeah, he's got to be a future Ireland international, but he has thrown his body around. He's put in some really big shots. He's been effective when he's come off the bench. I've been Im impressed with him. Uh, I know McCarthy's is, you know, a coming young player, but for now, yeah, Treadwell, I think has been a real find in an area that we've probably felt a vulnerability um, you know, over the course of the last few months where we had a, a great depth of second rows and all of a sudden that seems to have evaporated. Well, Treadwell, Kieran Treadwell is 26 years of age and he was only invited into the Six Nations uh, squad on account of Ulton Delan's departure. And generally at Ulster, he's sitting behind Henderson and Alan O'Connor. Andy Farrell, you know, you think the way he, he, he plumbed for Gibson Park ahead of most people, I think Andy Farrell, amongst other things, has a real eye for a player. I think he does. I, I agree with you. I think he's not afraid to select from um, obviously the, you know, the level behind frontier players for, for pr province. I think he obviously has an eye for what he thinks a player can add to his environment, to um, the way he wants to play the game, um, you know, be it um, an explosiveness, a ball carrying ability, a defensive now, um, you know, a collision winner. So I think he definitely has earmarked certain players. And as a result, there's certain players that feel as though they've warranted inclusion into a squad, but haven't quite made it. And a player like Jack O'Donoghue, who's an obvious, um, you know, a uh, mission from this tour, where is there something within Andy Farrell's thinking that he just doesn't fit into his role or mitt with what he's looking for in one of his back rowers? I know it's a very, you know, keenly contested area in this Irish team at the moment, great strength and depth. But, you know, with every one of those selections that have been maybe a little bit sh shocking or, or, you know, a little left field, there have been those omissions that, you know, have been, I suppose, have countered that opinion piece too. So... Um, I'm, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure you would have experienced that as a player at times where on the outside we would have wondered about a certain player and you have that intimate knowledge being on a pitch with someone or seeing them in training every day where everyone's asking why is an ex doing better and you say he has this thing and that's uh, Earl Z was that guy oh, Earl yeah. Z was that guy for years and there was always question marks about Keith around um, why isn't he doing it, you know, provincially and when he's getting his opportunity at, at international level? He, he burst on the scene very, very young as a 19 year old into that, you know, Munster um, Heineken Cup winning team in 08, um, sat on the bench and went on the Lions tour in 09. So, you know, I guess you've so much learning to do in those early years, but he, he had shown so much potential at training that it was very hard for coaches to leave him, leave him out when he was ripping up the, the you know, the first 15 as a, as a bag carrier when they, when we were playing defense and he'd tear us apart and we were like, geez, this guy really has proper X factor. So he's one that immediately stands out and then he develops and hones and, and adds aspects to his game. And now look at the career that he's had, particularly in the last five or six years, he's been a really important component to that Irish setup. Not always, not involved in every game, but when he is involved, he's never disappointed. So Kieran Frawley got generally, I mean, in most people's eyes, uh, very good reviews, and it's been a very good tour for him. And, and he was somebody, when we were looking at 10 at the start of the tour, we wondered, oh, he's going, he may fill in at 10 a bit, and, and boy, has he. So mm. uh, I presume he's impressed you, and then you can't not mention Frawley without Carberry. You've been away, so just to give you a sense, like Keith, or Keith Wood was in the show, this week, uh, I spoke to Jerry yesterday, and he was just reiter reiterating the sense he has that Carberry is very, very low in confidence at the moment, or not quite humming, and um, he's missed quite a few tackles. I was listening mm. to Luke Fitzgerald in his podcast, and uh, Luke didn't feel good saying this, and he was at pains to say, mm -hmm. "I don't feel good to say it, but I just feel he's lost his nerve a touch, and and who mm -hmm. knows why that might be." So there's a sense of one on the rise, and one, if not not quite in decline, but just stagnating a touch when this was a big opportunity? 
Yeah, I think we're all a little bit frustrated by the development of Joey because of how he burst onto the scene. You know, when you win your first test and come on against the All Blacks in Soldier Field and you're able to close out the game with with these amazing nerves of, you know, uh, it's like a, um, you know, the, the confidence of youth where it feels as though it's just slightly been eroded away from him. And whether that's come through, you know, the captaincy being given to Johnny, um, you know, he's, he's obviously very much, you know, playing for a 23 spot rather than a starting berth. He's had this succession of injuries that just haven't allowed him to get into any real continuity of play. I think the style of rugby being played down in Munster maybe hasn't evolved into what he anticipated when he joined the club a few years ago, leaving Leinster and all of their success. Um, so I think a multitude of factors have contributed to him not transpiring thus far. I'm not, you know, not clouding or shutting him out, but thus far turning into the player that we thought he was going to as a 21, 22 year old when he burst onto the scene. Um, and confidence is transient. It comes and it goes. And um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get and very easy to lose. And it's... Um, you know, he does look as though he's someone that is a little bit shaky at the moment. Um, it has to be a tough environment for him going in. Um, he's not starting very often. Um, it's very hard. You know, you've to, it's not just about, you know, oh, he's getting 15, 20 minutes. It's the whole week. It's controlling the team for the week. It's being the voice. It's dictating play. And I think that's what obviously Johnny is one of his great strengths. But Joey, in that environment, it has to be massively challenging knowing that his opposition is, yeah. you know, the most important player in the environment. And it's, hard, it's the captain and alpha. the leader and the heartbeat of everything. And and tens need to be alphas. They have to be dominant. They have to uh, bark orders. They have to be controlling things. They have to be the central voice. Um, and and in, in the past, when kind of Raj and, and David Humphreys were vying for position and, and Raj and Johnny were... Both of them were comfortable to be loud when they were in the position, but it's very difficult when the captain is the guy that is sure. um, is is in that starting berth. So I I feel for him. He, he, he I don't think he lacks bravery, but I but I think you know he looks a little bit frail at the moment. He does. He he looks physically. Um, I would be. I wouldn't like to draw comparisons to Raj because. Because Raj was brave, but just physically sometimes, you know, that couldn't match up to um, the size of some of the ball carriers that would co were coming at him. And I feel there's an element of that to, to Joey as well, that it's not that he's not trying. His tackle technique is good, just physically being overpowered. And I think there's definitely a confidence piece in the hit there as well, mm. where he knows that things are just not quite going the way they want to. And he's... He's hanging in there at the moment. I think that's the concern. It's that now there's a question mark, this debate around, do we look at an alternative option at 10 on the, on the bench? Is Frawley that guy? Because we know thus far that it hasn't really worked for, um, for Billy Burns, for um, Ross Byrne, Harry Byrne hasn't been able to stay fit. So Frawley is obviously the guy you know, that's on tour and that poses the greatest threat. And now he's shown relatively well in his, in his yeah. couple of outings against the Mario All Blacks. He was do, speaking to the media and made it clear he doesn't want to be a jack of all trades and he was pushed a little bit. Well, does that mean you want to be just Leinster 10? And he said, well, not necessarily because, you know, the 12 at Leinster is akin to a second playmaker. So I sort of feel like I'm developing in that sense. But I don't know if that's really satisfactory. Can you give us an insight here as best you can? Because this all feels like, um, you know... Uh, uh, informal conversations and, and, and strength of personality decides these things. Say Andy Farrell decides, I want Frawley to get X number of minutes at 10 across this season. It's very important. David Nusifor agrees with me. They sit down with Leo Cullen. To what extent, as you understand it, can the IRFU force Leinster's hand? I don't think that they can force their hand. I really don't. I think, you know, you... Um, you can encourage someone to do it, but ultimately if the coaches there um, don't feel as though it's in the best interests of, um, of the team in particular games, they're entitled to go with what works for them. I, I think they, they're not going to be so 
um, misaligned that they won't think that Frawley would be a, a, a really good viable option at 10, particularly on the back of Leinster's finish to the season. You know, unfortunately for Ross Byrne, you know, it wasn't a good climax to the season for him personally. So I think Leinster have to look at, at you know, the future as to what that position looks like. Ross had improved over the course of the season, but you know, in the clutch matches, it didn't happen for him. Um, now Frawley's been given the opportunity, looks as though he's taking it. I think th there's been there, not a glut of 10s, but plenty of 10s, but not so many 12s in the Leinster environment. But now that it hasn't worked out at 10, I think we will see more of Frawley naturally in the 10 position going forward. Also, um, the Leon player, uh, Charlie Natai, you know, coming in at 12, yeah. which I thought was a strange signing. But maybe that's all part of the master plan that now the Frawley is going to play more of a 10 role. And that's why Natai has been brought in to play 12 in those games that Robbie Henshaw is not, not being around. And, um, and I think naturally now on the back of what Stuart Lancaster and Leo Cullen will have seen in this test series or these uh, Mary games as well, they will feel very positive and comfortable with what Frawley has offered back at a 10 position. Mm. You know, it's lovely to have someone that's capable of playing both, but the reality is as a 10, you want to play there as often as you can. You don't want to be this jack of all trades. He's only ever going to be a jack of two trades um, of 10 and 12. And, you know, lots of other players are capable of playing both. Dan Carter played it a lot. Andre Pollard is doing it a lot. There's other good footballers that are capable of doing the two, but if you ask Kieran Frawley, if he's going to, if his opportunity is going to be at 10 for Ireland going forward, he's going to want to play there a hell of a lot more for Leinster too. Mm. So test two then, it felt like Ireland were utterly dominant. It really did. I agree. Um, you know, they, in many ways, they should have won by more. They created more opportunities. There were, um, you know, that yellow card where ring rows got taken out. I wonder was I was trying to look back on that. I think it's a, I think it's probably a penalty try if Johnny throws the pass. And I think okay. that's why it's not given as a penalty try in my head. They said that there was cover. I'm not sure about that. But I think if Johnny pops that pass to ring rows, um, whether he's going to get in or not, or um, I think that's it. I think that's going to be a, a penalty try. Um, and and so then the James Lowe one as well. They created other chances for themselves. The only thing I, I would say, and we're talking so much about the shape and, you know, the choices and, you know, the ball carry and everything. For me, what's been a huge part of Ireland's evolution, they've got this amazing defence now. This brilliant scramble defence, but this incredible organisation. I think that has been the huge improvement. That's quite, it's been the quiet undertone behind the shape and behind, you know, that pod and then what's happening outside the pod. That's all very easy to see. It's less glamorous stuff. The, the you know, the bodies up off the floor, the second efforts and um, the alignment of getting personnel into, key, into the certain positions, guys shooting at key times, sh closing the ball off. Uh, Robbie Henshaw's one on Moanga was a perfect example where they got the penalty after Sevu Reese cleared too far through the rook. Like, that's a huge moment in the game. You know, shutting that down with two or three men over on the outside to make a, 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 an impactful hit like that. And it happened with Bundy, it happened with Gary. I think the centres are really defending brilliantly well as a collective um, So and, and individually. So I think the defence has been the real find over the course of the last um, year and it hasn't gotten the attention that it's deserved. And uh, is that a different system in any great way to what they were doing 18 months ago or just better execution of sorts? I, I think better execution, to be honest with you. I think they're still doing, you know, still, they're still playing pretty high on the wing, but I think they've dropped back a fraction. Um, you know, Andy used to love having his winger playing really hard to give security to the 13 and, and it forced the 15 to cover an awful lot of ground. I think what you do have is you've got, someone that's very, very clever covering the backfield in Hugo Keenan. So it does allow the wingers to play higher, but the smart wingers are able to hedge their bets a little bit to still be able to cover a little bit of that, that backfield, but still give the security to the 13 to press high, knowing that they'll slam the gate with them if the 13 just makes a decision to shoot up on someone and try and shut the ball off. Because it's very hard 
it's all well and good to bat one pass on when you feel pressure coming at you. But then if your winger follows suit on, on your shooting up, it's very hard for that second player to bat on another ball to, to, to the winger that might be free. So I think I've always said that a, a winger can turn a bad decision from a 13 shooting up into a good decision. It's just about playing as a collective. And I think they've done that very well. It doesn't mean that you're going to always master it and you'll occasionally get cut out. Yeah. But, you know, shutting it down five out of six times is going to save you an awful lot of scores. Well, that's very encouraging, given that Mac Hansen is only in the door a wet week and James Lowe had his defensive capabilities questioned. So they're holding up their end of the bargain. They are, yeah. I, they really are. I think there's um, there's also a very clear understanding from um, Gibson Park playing on the edge with his winger too. Um, yeah, I think, that, you know, they've... And there have been a couple of question marks, probably, you know, one or two things that I've seen suggested that, you know, Mac Hansen very good going forward, but defensively, you know, still unproven. I think they've been very good so far. James Lowe, no doubt, has has improved significantly of his understanding of the system. Um, very different to what he would have experienced in New Zealand and has taken a few seasons to get where he wants to be. Um, but, um, yeah, I think... Just the, the understanding as to, um, you know, when to when to press hard, you know, getting their spacings, understanding who you're defending with as well, how much you're able to accelerate off the line when you've got a tight forward on your inside versus a back row forward. Mm -hmm. I'm defending differently if I've got Josh van der Fleer on my inside versus Ty Furlong. Those things are all important. You defend in threes always. You defend with the guy inside you and the guy outside you. Um, and you've got to have the knowledge of, of who that, what that personnel is like, you know, as a result of, you know, your, your ensuing um, line speed. So yes. um, they're, they're all factors and they're all happening in nanoseconds of being able to identify who's with me, what the personnel is that you're defending against. If you're, you're not looking at their numbers on their backs, but you're seeing their body shapes and you, you've, you're knowing, OK, three backs against us. I got to play it a little bit softer if I've got a tight forward inside me. Or if you see some of their front rowers or their tight five coming at you, you can play far more aggressively. Mm -hmm. So all of those little computing moments are happening um, that you know we're not maybe as aware of. And I think that's just a really well-drilled um, unit, but also some really smart individual decision-making. Okay, interesting. I hadn't heard that much discussed. As for the All Blacks then, I suppose one of the um, reasons for slight trepidation when we spoke on the eve of the tour was we just assumed probably a certain baseline level for the All Blacks. They're the All Blacks. They're going to be good regardless of who's in the jersey. But I, I, I think a lot of people have been quite surprised by the standard. This is most certainly not the 05 team that the Lions faced or the World Cup winning editions of 11 and, and 15. Uh, Ian Foster used words like unacceptable and, and substandard after Test 2. And I saw Sam Kane was talking today about 27. They've done their review. 27 unforced errors with the limited possession they had in test two so i mean you you said at the top of our chat there's a degree of ireland smelling blood this is not the all blacks of, of previous it's not i think if you look at the personnel versus you know the names of their hugely successful teams it's you know they haven't um earned the international respect yet that's not to say that that mightn't come in time but right now if you look at the the team sheets of what you're up against there's there's not many international household names that would give you huge trepidation. Of course, there's the Bowden Barretts, um, you know, several Reese's on on their day. Um, you know, uh, Aaron Smith, who's coming to the winter of his career. But beyond that, you know, you look at Ritalik and Whitelock, very much autumn winter of their career as well. Whitelock was missed at, in the second test, um, having Barrett in the second row instead. Papalihi, who they've you know, really been talking up, you know, is I think is probably a, a, a standout performer that's going to really move, you know, move on to great things. But I think if you look across the team versus the other all black team, great all black teams of the last decade, two decades, it doesn't feel like it's the same, um, same level of impactful individuals. Um, Richie McCaw versus Sam Kane. Sam Kane, a lovely player, but he's not Richie McCaw as, um, Peter Omani <laughs> so um, pleasantly told. Um, so there's there is that factor. We, we also have to remember too that for years we held them in such high you know regard because we couldn't beat them, couldn't quite get it done, and we nearly did it in 2013, and then 
And then it is a case of breaking the seal. It really is. You know, the first one is so often the hardest. And then we've managed, you know, three more after Chicago. After Chicago. So um, it, it, the, the myth, the unbeatable mm. myth is dispelled, it's gone. It's, mm. it's not coming back. And so, you know, we've all, we always have a healthy respect for them, but the fear factor for, for now is certainly gone. And I think, you know, potentially for, for quite some time, because we win four of seven, it changes the environment that new players are coming into. Next time they play against them, they'll all, these, the, the new crew will, for the next decade, always mm. be playing with someone that has played and beaten against, beaten the All Blacks. So that gives a confidence with the messaging that's going on throughout the week of those games, in test matches, the security of going, it's grand, we know how to get this done. Mm. So let's just keep, you know, keep with the process, keep with our game plan, and we'll be okay. We'll give ourselves a chance of victory. So it feels like the landscape has changed in a big way. But you always say that with a mindfulness that this you know what the all blacks have been capable of doing in the past when they're they you know it hasn't been very often where they've been written off that they're always going to be a dangerous beast and yeah. they have their backs to the walls in a major way their coaches you know ticket is on the line this weekend well i wanted to ask you so i mean rugby is still and always will be a very emotional sport because of the physicality involved and so you've been in both of these dressing rooms across your career the momentum and the confidence is in the Irish dressing room and in the New Zealand dressing room, we have that backs against the wall. Let's get ready for a backlash, frustrated energy. And, you know, Sam Kane was talking about that today, uh, which is more powerful, do you suspect? Um, I think it can go two ways. Like, I think if you look at the fear factor, God, I've, I remember playing scared many times and nothing like sharpening your your anticipation, your desire, your you know need to taste blood. All of those aspects are huge when you play frightened. When something, when embarrassment is at stake, um, and it's something. It's 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 a it's it's something that they would rarely have have ta have tasted and, and known. So it'll be really interesting to see how they do react to that this weekend. Um, on the flip side we're always mindful when we've gone well of not losing the run of ourselves and yes you have to be confident but rugby is an emotional game mm. it is about it is 80 percent you know um top three four inches and physically that you know the remaining 20 percent. and if you can get your pitch right well you've got a great chance of of the, the physical side of the game following suit on on, on what you're thinking and um, so I, I guess coming from an Irish perspective, I think you, you're always a bit sharper when um, when your backs were to the wall because mm. I maybe had more experience with that, that we're more often than underdog. We're all more often being written off. But this is a different change. This is a changed Irish team. There's a different mentality with them and they've got to carry this confidence going forward into a world cup if we are to try and get to that elusive semi-final and get on from a semi-final and get to a final and try and win it because we we you know we can't shy away from the fact that we 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 do not, not just try to go once one phase further we, you want to try and go and win a world cup and if you can beat the best teams in the world regularly then you can go and do it but you still have to go and deliver you were saying we're not too sure what you expect from the All Blacks in this kind of position. One thing I think we would all anticipate is physicality. And we saw that post Chicago and the Robbie Henshaw tackle. And, you know, they are going to come out and be very physical, which unfortunately brings the referees into discussion again. So, we, you know, this constant tug of war, Andy Farrell unhappy with Dickinson in the first test, Dickinson with the, um, the refereeing of the breakdown. And then, I mean, Jakob Piper, we <laughs> get your thoughts in a moment on how he did and so now it's Wayne Barnes and uh, from hating him in 07 when France beat them in the World Cup they are now love bombing him so Sam Kane said we are really comfortable with Wayne's refereeing style I'm looking forward to working with him He's like, working with him he's the referee you're not working with him but <laughs> this is the tone that they're they're bringing so uh, what type of game in in your experience and, and just observing does Barnes allow to happen 
Well, I've seen a variety. I think like all teams, he changes, you know, he hasn't just gone a particular route from, you know, from the very early days of, remember him refereeing Ireland versus Bayonne back in 2007. That was my first experience where it was an absolute free for all. And he uh, allowed, you know, um, wildness, you know, carry on. Whereas, you know, the game's obviously very different to then. Even if you look at how he, um, refereed the um, Champions Cup final. Um, I think it'll suit the All Blacks really playing on the edge. Um, I think he let the breakdown play out an awful lot more than lots of Northern Hemisphere referees do. Maybe with the French referees taken out of that, particularly of the English referees, I think he'll really allow you play a lot at, at rook time, wants the attacking team to stay in possession as much as you possibly can. But if you show a really good picture defensively, get in very early um, and you can stay in there for a few seconds. Um, you know, he's not someone that's very hot with his whistle where you're in there, show a good position for a second, second and a half, and he gives you that penalty. You're going to have to ride out a storm of take a couple of collisions. If you can stay in there with the ball, then he'll give you the penalties. So, it's you know he's not as loose as as someone um like um Nigel Owens maybe that just wants the, the the attacking team to do what they want to do but I have seen his style change a little bit where he is looking for a free-flowing game an awful lot more um but yeah he is a referee that likes to stamp his authority early on even going back to when I was playing when we'd analyze the referee that was one of his things that you know, don't be the guy to be caught not rolling away from a tackle in the first two minutes of the game because he wants to show that. He wants to say, I'm not going to have that today. I want a clear rook. I want, you know, clear definition as to who the tackler is. And, and when you're done your job, get the hell out of there. So there's those aspects. And, and they will, you know, the, the, the work done on referees is similarly detailed to work done on the opposition because they do have their habits. They do have their idiosyncrasies, their... Mm their go-to hates and and things that they want to see um so yeah I, w- I wonder what that evolution looks like to the Irish and analysis team I, I'm not entirely sure where where that has gone you know when I'm watching games I'm watching the referee but to be honest with you there's enough to watch in in the two teams that are playing against one another and you want as little um interruption from the referee as possible no I hear you so you didn't get your wish in test two what did you make of Jakob Piper um, again, you know, like I, I can't say, um, you know, anything stood out like a sore thumb. Oh, you know, obviously the, there's always the Kiwis will complain about certain things. We'll complain about no penalty try for that ring rose early tackle and the yellow card. Um, you know, with the, the sin binning of, of Leicester, could that have been a, a red card? Yeah, well, the referees will would say yes. There, there has been... Um, there's been a, a bit of a disparity between Southern Hemisphere and, and Northern Hemisphere on the collision side of the games, the head injuries. They've been an awful lot more lax then in the South than they have in the North. And mm. even with international rugby players that I'm a board member on, there's still a you know, bit of a tug of war from the North to the South as to what constitutes head collisions, what's worthy of yellow, red penalties and so on. So it didn't shock me to hear that he's trying to keep us, you know, 15 versus 15 as much as he, he yeah. can and certainly not have those early red cards. Even if you look at the, the, um, the red card incident, you know, his first comments are, Oh, look, you know, it just looks like an accident. Look, looks like just, at, so that's what he's looking for. That's his gut is like, Let's try and work back from there. It's he not like, hang on, I saw that. It's yeah, a red he me- card. He mentioned know? mitigation straight away. He was straight into, yeah, let's, let's exactly. find some mitigation. Yeah, exactly. So, and listen, I, I understand because the, the concerns of the game is that when you do go 15, 14, mm. um, it's, it, you know, people say, oh, it's ruining the game. It's not ideal. It's not. We want sure. 15 versus 15. We do. But we also want safety. We want to get to a point where, you know, we're getting those habits changed and you're going you're going to have moments like that in 20 years time where the reaction time is not quick enough body height is not good enough and when you get head on head collision it was a, as clear a red card as we've seen in quite some time and mm. um, so i you know i i guess i'm always mindful that anytime you come out in the right side of the result oh yeah i thought the referee did a great job you know you know because you'll feel as though you got the you know the breaks whereas 
I'm sure, you know, from a Kiwi perspective, if you were talking to one of the, you know, the, the ex-players that they would have, they'd pick up five or six different sure. moments where he killed them or he, you know, forced them into, um, into decision-making where, you know, it didn't, it didn't seem fair. So, um, Maybe I need to go back and watch the 80 minutes of just focusing on Jakob Piper. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. There's no, there's no need to do that. So with a view to this third test, then a lot of reasons to feel very confident from an Irish perspective. If there's one nagging doubt and we, we referenced it, it's that for all their possession and territory in, in test one as well, it's maybe not resulting in what it should on the scoreboard. And it's hard to think they'll completely dominate again in test three and, and maybe New Zealand do things to get more of the ball and more territory. So Ireland may have to be um, a bit more ruthless when they do get the occasional opportunity. I mean, I, 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 maybe they dominate every, the first 25 minutes of every game. I don't know, but it, it's hard to wish for that. So they are going to have to take chances when they come, you would think. They can't be as... Um, would you call it wasteful? Um, at, at times, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's not unfair to, to say that, that James Lowe you know, drop pass where it looks as though it's a certain score that is wasteful. Yeah. But, you know, he'll he'll say that himself. Um, um, yeah, there were other chances where, you know, they could have, um, you know, they they could have not necessarily scored tries, but really squeezed that scramble defense, which was pretty impressive at times from the All Blacks as well. Let's not take away from that. Very impressive scramble back in Dublin in November. Impressive again when they're on the back foot. So. There's, there's plenty, you know, of, of heart and spirit, as you would suggest, with an, this all-black team, yeah. even when it's not going right. I, do you know what? I, I'm, I'm kind of crystal balling and looking at, you know, at the World Cup next year. What, what's the best result from an Irish perspective? If we do get New Zealand in a World Cup quarterfinal, would you prefer them to be coached by Ian Foster or would you prefer <laughs> them to be coached by... Um, Scott Robertson and Joe and or Joe Schmidt Um, and as we're watching the All Blacks over the course of last year you'd have to suggest the former so is a loss to them this weekend you know bigger picture um, um, potentially a better result Uh, I'm not saying it wouldn't be but um, I'd be nervous around Scott Robertson coming in and Joe Schmidt coming in and pulling the quality at their disposal together and Mm -hmm and pushing it in a more collective direction um, with a bit over a year to go. So, yeah, I'm, maybe a draw is the, the, the outcome <laughs> that we're looking for. Not, but no one wants to see that, do they? Who do you make favourites? Oh, yeah, like, New sorry. Zealand. The, yeah. yeah, New Zealand are always going to be favourites yeah. at home. You know, um, have, the, have the All Blacks ever not been favourites in a, in a home game? I, I, I wouldn't, no. certainly not in my, not in my lifetime. Um, so it remains the case, but I don't know what the bookies have on the spread, but mm. you'd probably think six or seven or maybe, you know, yeah. somewhere in and around that. I think it'll be a close game again. I, I really right. do. Um, it's very hard to put, put it in, you know, point in one direction or the other. I, I'm, I'm intrigued as to see how they deal with that pressure that is coming on them. The scrutiny of the media. I saw what's been said in... Um, in the New Zealand Herald, you know, everyone, you know, calling for the coaching ticket head. So what they've done this week or what they will be doing this week in preparing their team will be very interesting in the, in the, in the overall outcome as to how they secure their jobs. And as a result of what their players put into effect on, on Saturday. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think it'll be very little between the teams. I don't think this Irish team will even if you get up against a great New Zealand performance, I think the confidence confidence levels are high with Ireland that they will stay in and they will create opportunities with their shape and game plan and their defence. So um, I think it'll be, you know, 10 points one way or the other. It won't be, it won't be bigger. Mm. Uh, Sam Kane, by the way, I mean, you can imagine the atmosphere in there because he's been asked about the Peter Mahoney uh, line who do you think you are, pal? You're a shit, Richie McCoy. He's been asked about this at the training session. And what did he say? He said, uh, and I just, you couldn't not see the Alan Partridge um, meme here. He said, it was just good <laughs> rugby banter. <laughs> it was great banter. Uh, what did Lynn have to say about it? <laughs> he said, uh, it's just good rugby banter. It's good stuff. Sam Kane lied at training. And then uh, the reporter tried to follow up and say, but did you hear the exact wording? And at that stage, the press officer jumped in and said, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. So 
uh, I guess all parts of uh, fun and games. I'm sure you've you, you've had some teammates or opposition who had an acid tongue. You yeah, weren't that I, type, I, I didn't think. No, it wasn't my cup of tea, no. Um, I played beside Raj for 10 years. <laughs> like he said, some horrific things to, to people. Um, yeah, I remember James James Hook going on the Lions Tour in 09 and being a little bit afraid of Raj because of what he'd said to him earlier on in the Six Nations <laughs> and, and how he judged him as a rugby player and him going and thinking, I don't think Raj rates me. It's like, why? Because <laughs> I couldn't repeat what he said on here, but he literally tore me a new one. Um, and um, I was like, I, I bet you Raj doesn't even remember that. Like, no. it's just... It just used to come out from, it was venomous. Um, but um, yeah. I think he told, Sexton you're a no, he told Sexton you're a nobody early on yeah. in the 09 season. Yeah, yeah, that's where it all, that's where the shape yeah, yeah. came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like one thing I've learned with Johnny is, you know, he's, um, yeah, he stores it. He's, he, he, he'll, he'll remember it a year, two years later if needs be. So, and he'll, it'll come back at you. So um, yeah. Like some of the stuff from Raj was was very entertaining. Uh, I, I I just didn't have time. I, I don't think I had the energy to be yeah. getting into that chat. I didn't. It didn't do anything for me motivation wise. Right. Uh, last one in a minute. I, I can't not mention this. Very interesting. There are uh, reports now in England and France that Rassi ninety two are circling around Stuart Lancaster. I'm sure you've probably heard those uh, rumors. And I guess given their resources and presumably the salary they can offer and Paris is not the worst place in the world to live and top 14 experience might be something he's open to. Uh, they've a bit of a fight to keep him, you would think. Yeah. Listen, it's, 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 it's inevitable that, um, that Stuart's going to be getting, you know, these job offers, um, in, you know, if, this isn't the last of them with um, with Racing, and I, I would imagine that he's going to take one in maybe not this year, but you know, in in the coming years, not too distant future, because he's got aspirations to be a head coach. I suppose it depends on what happens within the Leinster environment and what role he continues to have. Um, so there's a bit to play out there, but he, he you know, one, I think he'll be frustrated by one. Um, Heineken Cup in the last six years, considering they've been in three finals, other semi-finals, and whether he feels as though there's unfinished business there or not, let's hope so. But um, I think it does feel like it will be inevitable that he'll go somewhere. Be it, I don't think back to England. I think yes, he'd want to go to an environment where he feels as though he's going to be able to win the European Cup, and geez, you know, with the the quality of, of Rassing and the checkbook that's there and the potential to bring in and attract other players, that would be certainly a, a one to, to ponder from his perspective. Yeah, we'll watch that space. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, uh, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Brian O'Driscoll, pleasure. Thanks so much. Nice one, Joe. Talk to you later.